Oops, I can grab my notes. All right, so uh, Heather Brevard is uh, part of our digital and app innovation team. She's a specialist that focuses in helping life sciences customers modernize and reimagine their digital experiences. Heather's background includes working in the Microsoft Office product group where she drove infrastructure and DevSecOps modernization that powered the transformation of Office from a box product to the web-based SaaS platform, as well as some incubation products that explored incorporating AI into office support and productivity experiences. And she's coming to us live from Madison, Wisconsin. So without further ado, I've got your screen. Go ahead, come off mute and take it away, Heather. All right, thanks so much, Matt. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. I know it's in the afternoon now, perhaps some of you have had uh, lunch today, and you know we might be getting into that uh, food coma time of day for you. Um, so we really appreciate you all taking the time to to come out and spend time with us. Um, how many of you, just by you know a raise of the team's hand here, think that a lot of what we've been talking about with the open AI technology is just you know a really cool technology? We had some some raised hands. Yeah, looks like we've got some hands going up. Yep, keeps climbing, keeps climbing. I think you know we can all agree that uh, the strides that we've been making, especially in generative AI as an industry recently, are super cool. But how many of you feel like you already have an idea of a, a digital experience, a customer focus experience, an operational focus experience that you want to incorporate this type of technology into? Did anyone come in here today knowing you know, I have exactly the use case in mind. Um, I, I put the customer uh, experience at the forefront of that. Um, anybody, anybody like that? Well, many, many fewer hands, it looks like. And so I, I think sometimes what we like to do as technologists is a really cool technology comes into the market and becomes available. And, uh, you know, we want to just stuff it into everything as fast as we can. Um, which I, I think just speaks to our, our curiosity as technologists. But what we really want to make sure that we're doing is putting the user experience at the forefront of that. So a lot of what we're going to talk about in this section is how do you actually make those AI powered experience real and tangible uh, to your customers, to the internal folks that you're supporting. And so one of my, my favorite quotes that kind of in, encapsulates this really well, I think, is from our good friend Steve Jobs. Um, you've got to really start with the customer experience and work backwards into the technology. You can't start with the technology and try to figure out where you're going to sell it. And so I think that's very, very true for all of us right now in the cognitive or in the generative AI moment, right? We really need to think about you know, what is that business value that we're trying to generate? What is that experience that we're working towards? And leverage AI as a tool to create that experience um, instead of just trying to shove AI wherever we can into our existing product set. So uh, we've been talking a lot about the open AI service today, about some of the underlying data services that power the models. Um, but we're really going to talk about, you know, how do you make these applications real? And you can actually use Azure OpenAI not only to create interesting new experiences, but to help you figure out why you should build something, what in fact you should build, and how to actually build that. And so the way that this tends to work is we can actually use OpenAI as a way of powering design thinking for our applications, right? OpenAI can be sort of the summarization tool for us that helps us identify user pain points through large language model mining and really brings to the surface for us new insights in terms of you know, why we should be thinking about building um, certain experiences into our application and, and resolving for certain customer pain points. We can also use OpenAI to determine what exactly it is that we can build, right? And we've seen a lot of these use cases so far today, and we'll show a few more demos in this session as well, um, where we can use it to create embedded assistance, right? That classic chat GPT style uh, question and answer capability. Um, but we can also orchestrate uh, multimodal foundational models, right? How you can enable experimentation um, directly into your application experience without necessarily requiring 
the user to go ahead and, and create that question that results in that um, response coming back to the user. Um, you can also enable user and historical context and deliver hyper personalized UXs, right? Bringing that AI insights to the forefront in a very personalized manner, uh, which makes our applications feel like they were designed for the individual versus designed for the masses. And then finally, around how we can actually build these application services, right? So once you figured out why you want to build something, what you want to build, um, we can actually help accelerate code de development and deployment using OpenAI, right? So if you think about uh, GitHub Copilot or the Codex model that OpenAI has, being able to create rapid prototypes, um, create intelligent experiences using natural language instead of some of the traditional coding that um, classically needed to go into to creating these experiences. Um, so really all throughout the tool chain of the way that we think about uh, what and why and how to build something, uh, AI is really changing that and OpenAI in particular, um, helping us make new strides as developers, technologists, creators to change um, the way that, that we're approaching this type of um, way, way of building things. So there are a couple of use cases and patterns of value that I want to touch on that we are seeing commonly now in healthcare. And these are a very, very small set, subset of the total number of different types of ways you can think about incorporating AI into your applications and building those uh, int uh, intelligent experiences from the forefront. So the first is around life sciences research summarization. And so we've already seen a bit of um, content around this today, but really how can we think about as life sciences organizations finding maybe the next big drug discovery that's sitting somewhere in that pile of millions of research documents that we have at our disposal, right? It would take a human being uh, lifetimes to be able to go through and synthesize all that, but OpenAI helps us really summarize that and uh, see insights where we weren't able to see them before, uh, which could uh, come in the in the form of our next big treatment idea that could save thousands of lives. In the health solution space, we of course have intelligent medical devices, right? Think about if uh, our medical solutions providers were able to take um, all of the medical devices that might touch an individual throughout their healthcare journey and aggregate data across various different endpoints and uh, provide insights uh, before some sort of medical emergency happens where we can say, you know, based on your watch and what happened in one of your lab tests from your recent uh, primary care provider visit, you know, we can begin to, to bring all of this data together and, and our generative AI models can start to say, you know, we've noticed something that could be foreshadowing some sort of health incident for you. Maybe you should get care in these ways. And then finally, of course, around our, our providers and our payers, uh, really thinking about how to enhance the patient and member engagement experience, how to improve retention and loyalty and reduce costs to engage through this experience where you're able to interact with the AI um, as sort of a co-pilot throughout your healthcare journey that follows you um, between your different healthcare touch points with your providers, which is, of course, a very powerful situation only made possible by generative AI. So a lot of people usually ask me when we start talking about, you know, how do you build application experiences around the AI framework? Um, and I, I like to mention that um, it really is the Azure platform holistically, not just the Azure Open AI, Open AI API, but all of the different application services that are built into Azure that make Azure the fastest, cheapest, and most secure way to build these bleeding edge model uh, based applications. And so when you think about uh, bringing data and bringing application experiences into Azure along with leveraging the Azure Open AI API, um, you get inference at scale with the lowest latency, right? You could hypothetically call Azure Open AI, AP, Open AI from another cloud or from on-premises, um, but you introduce latency when you do that. Um, sometimes uh, a lot of the networking costs can catch up you, to you really quickly. Um, it's actually relatively inexpensive to leverage the, app, uh, the Azure OpenAI API, um, but it's that uh, egress or that NAT cost that really adds up quickly, especially if you're doing a large number of calls. 
Um, so you don't have to incur those additional networking costs when you're crossing cloud or on premises boundaries in order to leverage the Azure OpenAI API. And finally, um, it is the most secure and compliant end to end way of making sure that your private data and embeddies aren't crossing networking boundaries um, that could cause potential um, security risks and introduce sort of risks and other points of failure into the way that your applications are built. So um, we love it, of course, when our, our partners, when our customers are leveraging the Azure OpenAI, even when they have data and application services in other clouds. Um, but typically, it tends to work out best for everyone involved um, when we go ahead and make sure that we are consolidating a lot of that into the Azure portfolio end to end. So before we get into a demo here, I want to just kind of provide this high level overview, this high level snapshot of the Azure application platform and why we talk about there being more to building AI based applications than just calling the open AI API. And so typically when we think about an application developer, someone who's building a, a technical experience, right, they tend to live in in a world full of their IDEs. Um, their automation tools, their DevOps workflows. And of course, the Azure ecosystem has, and the Microsoft ecosystem has a lot of those tools natively built in. Um, we love our customers that are using Visual Studio Code, uh, leveraging GitHub or Azure DevOps to continuously integrate their applications, um, to create new applications, build and manage applications over time. And that helps them land in sort of this overall platform that's going to help them manage and maintain these apps. And so um, first, when we think about building the app, of course, you need the client, right? Whether you're building a, a mobile app, a browser based app, a desktop app, or even an app here in Teams or some other SaaS product that allows you to extend functionality. Um, you know, the, the client is really where you need to think about starting because the client is ultimately what's going to deliver that end, end user experience. Um, and that client typically relies on some type of secure front end. Um, and we have a, a variety of services in Azure, of course, that, that provide that front end hosting capability, whether you're looking to spin up uh, a simple web application or you're looking to uh, run a, a containerized front end or you're doing uh, spring apps or even low code, no code front ends with power apps. Um, your front end often will connect back into some sort of API or, or traffic management service, um, whether that's Azure API management that makes it really easy to discover, reuse APIs across the ecosystem. Um, or application gateway or Azure front door that helps with a lot of that traffic management and routing components. Um, and you also need that prompt orchestration engine, right? Especially when we have, we're taking user input to determine how AI is going to modify the user experience in your front end. Um, that prompt orchestration engine is really about how do you take in that user input? How do you synthesize it? Um, and make sure that you're sending everything that you need to um, and, and taking in all of the context, more importantly, that you need to um, in order to uh, help the OpenAI APIs provide the best, um, the best answer to, to whatever that question is. Um, one of the big things that we actually just recently announced at Build is the Semantic Kernel SDK, which is an open source project now um, native in Azure. And so semantic kernel, of course, being an SDK that's going to help facilitate things like um, providing your open AI with those memories and, and those models in that context that's going to enrich the types of responses that you're getting from the API model. Um, finally, you know, session and token data tier um, where you think about how do you make sure that you have uh, in memory understanding of what has previously happened in, in the session that the user started. And then, of course, your foundation uh, around the OpenAI APIs and other data services um, that are used to train the model. So with that, we're going to go ahead and jump into one of the projects that was actually listed in the trivia question that we had before this, uh, directly before this session, and that is Project Miyagi. And so Project Miyagi is all about um, showing all of you as our customers you know, what could this look like in terms of a full 
uh, application and, and user experience that's built on the OpenAI APIs. And so we'll dive deep into sort of what that demo is all about, and then we'll come back to this architecture and look at how some of those components were built. So Miyagi is actually not a healthcare use case, um, but it is a use case I think we can all sort of identify with, which is a personal finance use case. So Miyagi was really designed as a demo um, to help understand, you know, what if we were to really build an intelligent experience around personal finance and have OpenAI serve kind of as our, our co-pilot, if you will, in our personal finance lives. And so what you'll notice in here right off the bat is we have our traditional uh, question and answer chat GPT style bot on the on the right hand side here. So given uh, all of the information that this demo has around investments and assets and things that I have in in my name, um, you know, I could go ahead and just start asking random questions about my portfolio. And you know, we would go back and forth, Miyagi and I, um, in this chat style. Um, but I think there's some more interesting use cases that are beyond sort of the traditional chat GPT use case that we're all familiar with. And that is around top investments. And so I actually have a, a GPT recommendation that's contributing to the creation of this list. And so what's happening on the back end here is OpenAI is going through all of the investments and all of the assets that I have in my portfolio. And it is providing recommendations for uh, new investments um, or around existing investments about what it thinks that I may want to, to consider around, uh, you know, getting more of that investment, um, selling off that investment, buying and holding that investment, right? A lot of strategies in terms of how we can think about investing. So we can see here with Microsoft, um, at this particular price in this moment in time, since we last trained the model, um, you know, GBT is, is recommending that we capitalize and invest in, in Microsoft off of the AI buzz. Um, it, coincidental, perhaps, that this ended up in a Microsoft focused demo, but there you go. Um, it also has some comments in here around Accenture, right? Perhaps adding Accenture to the portfolio, which isn't already in there, um, might be a, a good idea to keep up with technical trends. Um, and then around JP Morgan, it's suggesting, you know, perhaps dollar cost averaging over the coming months um, to help capitalize on the increase in deposit base is where we want to go. And so I can actually, with the this particular demo, customize these types of um, recommendations that are being provided to me based on uh, my sort of philosophy as an investor. So I can come in here and specify, you know, if I have a particular favorite investing subreddit, um, perhaps if I were to put in, you know, Wall Street bets here instead of value investing, I'd get a very different set of stocks recommended to me. You know, perhaps I'd see uh, AMC and GameStop at the top of this list instead of um, some of the more blue chip stocks that we see here. And I can also come in and uh, select a favorite financial advisor. Um, it's set to Jim Cramer currently, but if I was more into long-term buy and hold value investing, big Wall Street, um, perhaps Warren Buffett might be a, a better fit. Um, and then I can specify the risk tolerance as well, whether I want to go more aggressive or more moderate in my risk tolerance. And by clicking personalize here, all of these uh, will get updated to uh, really specify um, sort of and, and tailor and personalize the experience that I have in here um, to what my profile as an investor is. And so that's where a lot of that context, we as application developers have to think very carefully about what types of context we need to feed those open AI models to most successfully turn up results that are going to be relevant to the individual that's expecting a personalized experience from an AI powered application. So how is some of this built? So this is the high level of the Miyagi architecture. Um, and there's a lot happening in this example. Um, this is actually available for you to play around with on GitHub, right? So this is an open source project that Microsoft has put out as a learning tool for all of our customers. Um, so at the end of the session, I'll go ahead and drop the GitHub link in this chat. And if you want to meet with a Microsoft representative and go a little bit deeper into um, how these things get built, how you might be able to use this as an example architecture for building your own application. Um, we can certainly set up 
uh, some time with the, the appropriate folks from your account team after this call um, to do a more in-depth workshop around these things as well and just give you the, the chance to play with some of these components under the supervision of, of some of our uh, specialists in this area. And so, um, of course, as part of this Miyagi architecture, we can't forget our inner loop, all right, that strong DevSecOps foundation. Um, this was built both with Visual Studio Code as well as GitHub Copilot, right? So our um, local experts here um, at Microsoft didn't have to write every single line of code by themselves. Uh, luckily, they had their GitHub Copilot set up. Um, that was able to do a lot of the plumbing code for them so that they didn't have to. Um, and my buddy Steve will actually be doing a GitHub Copilot session um, shortly after we wrap up here. Um, but in addition to the uh, software development lifecycle components in here, we of course have all of the cloud infrastructure that powers this experience. Um, so in this particular experience, we of course cannot forget our Azure API management solution, which is designed to make sure that any of the APIs that were developed as part of this project are reusable to other groups and to other projects. Um, and so it makes it really easy for other developers at Microsoft in the open source uh, world to onboard, discover, find those APIs, leverage them, um, and not have to reinvent the wheel if there are certain components that they found in here that were particularly useful. Um, this particular project is built on a React.js front end um, and is powered in the back end by uh, Kubernetes. But uh, if you were to actually deploy this yourself, you would have the option to choose from a couple of different um, microservices based architecture uh, infrastructure to make this happen, right? So whether you're wanting to do your traditional Kubernetes, if that's what you're totally comfortable with, or um, if maybe you don't have a background in Kubernetes, don't wanna deal with the headache of spinning up your own cluster. Um, we of course have the Azure Container Apps offering, which is essentially serverless Kubernetes um, for deploying a lot of these microservices without having to exert the amount of control and effort and uh, operational requirements that creating a traditional Kubernetes cluster might. And we also have Azure Red Hat OpenShift and Azure Spring Apps as well, um, if, if those tend to be your preference. And so there are a number of microservices that power that experience that we already saw. Um, there's order intake, um, the advisory service that was going and creating a lot of those um, recommendations, personalization, et cetera. And of course, all of that flows back into the semantic kernel, which is how we're getting that context, right? All of those personalized preferences back to the Azure Open API, AI API, um, which of course is, is the foundation for how all of that personalization comes about. Um, and then a variety of uh, unstructured databases on the back end, as well as a little bit of structured databases as well um, to provide some of those, uh, that long-term storage um, for the way that we're pulling in um, some of that data to, to train the model occasionally um, to update how uh, OpenAI is, is handling some of those recommendations. So I think we are a little short on time here, so I'll skip the next demo and we'll go right to if there's any questions so far before I hand it off to Steve. Yeah, thanks, Heather. Um, so the chat has been a little bit quiet, but we did get one that came in through the uh, submission. Um, so this came from Joe. The question is, is there any value to modernizing my application before or while incorporating AI? That is a great question. So when I work with a lot of customers, there's the age old question of do I create the new AI functionality first? or do I modernize my existing application, get rid of legacy technical debt um, and, and go from there? Sort of how do I think about that trade-off between infrastructure modernization and that new functionality? And my recommendation to a lot of folks is, uh, you know, obviously it highly depends on your specific circumstances and what the needs of your business are, but it can sometimes be very difficult to incorporate AI experiences into legacy infrastructure. And so you're really paying it forward in terms of making it 
substantially easier for you to go ahead and introduce that AI component if you really focus on the foundational modernization first. Um, so definitely something to think about. Um, we have a digital and app innovation specialists who support a variety of our customers in the healthcare space. Um, so if that is a question that your team is grappling with currently, um, we're always happy to connect you with uh, your appropriate representative and, and help you think through those trade-offs um, in a way that's personalized to what your team's trying to achieve. Excellent. Appreciate the answer to the question there. Um, there are a couple of others, but I think we are getting to time, unfortunately, and I'm going to uh, I think I'm going to cut things off there. Uh, but again, thank you, Heather, for the overview as well as the demonstration. Excellent stuff. Sounds good. Next presenter. So she starts bringing up her presentation. I'll go ahead and uh, and get rolling with that.